Welcome to the Feisty Women's Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gross, Ironman champion, PhD in women's history, and founder and CEO of Feisty Media. I started this show because I wanted to cut through the BS of diet culture and fitness culture and actually learn from high achieving women at the top of their game who have figured out how to feel and perform their best at every stage of life. So I chat with experts, elite athletes, and leaders who have learned to succeed despite the massive gender data gap in exercise and medical science and product development. Every episode is filled with information, advice, and anecdotes that will help you fulfill your potential as an athlete, mom, leader, or business owner. And listen up. If you don't subscribe to our women's performance newsletter, you are definitely missing out. It's totally free. So head over to womensperformance.com and subscribe now. That's womensperformance.com. This podcast is a production of Feisty Media. Hi, everyone. So today is a very special day because we are going to learn all about the most studied ergogenic aid on the market. So that aid is creatine, and our expert guest is Shannon O'Grady from Gnarly Nutrition. Shannon is the COO and Chief Product Officer at Gnarly. She also has a PhD in Nutritional Physiology. She loves trail running, climbing, cycling, and also used to be a triathlete, weren't we all? (laughs) Um, And she has recently become a master's world champion in jujitsu. Shannon is responsible for new product development at Gnarly, and she lets the latest research and science help determine potential brand extensions and directions. As Shannon and I discuss, creatine is having a moment. Most of you have probably noticed that. The research points to many benefits from the typical ones like increased muscle mass or muscle mass maintenance for aging athletes to benefits for the brain and our overall health span. Even though I've already been taking creatine for a year, I learned a ton and may even increase my dose slightly based on my discussion with Shannon. So I hope you all enjoy. Good morning, Shannon. Welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for being here. Okay, when I Googled you yesterday, um, it came up right away with Shannon the Menace O'Grady. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't click through on it because I was like, what? I'm going to ask about that. (laughs) What what is that a reference to? (laughs) Um, I have a lot of nicknames in jujitsu and that is one of them. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had actually forgotten about that one. There's the (laughs) there's Mighty Barnacle of Death. There's Meatball. Like there's so many many names. Um, And I'm really a nice person. I've (laughs) but <laughs> I always think it's a good sign when people give you fun nicknames you know like that's like they like you then right yes I I and I can remember clearly every single person that's given me those nicknames and they're all really close friends so um yes I they're all well well-meaning and kind of like tongue-in-cheek right but you do that is a reference to the fact that you do jujitsu now right is that like I, I know that you came from endurance sports, so I really wanted to ask about this because like I said before the show, like I'm a little bit jujitsu curious <laughs> and I have a couple of friends who are, who have taken it up and love it. Yeah. Um, but I can't like, as someone who like goes in a straight line without anybody touching me <laughs> for, for most of my life, it's hard to imagine like taking up jujitsu at this point. I mean, I, I feel like I've always been kind of interested in martial arts. I don't know if like I may be a little older than you, but I remember, you know, the karate kid came out and I was fully doing the crane pose like post movie and, you know, was always kind of interested in martial arts ever since I was a child, but never really tried them. And uh, when I was pregnant with my second child, um, a, a boss at the job I was at at the time had kind of planted the seed. I didn't know what jujitsu was. Um, it's really good for self-defense um, because most fights and attacks end up on the ground and jujitsu is 
a grappling sport. So it's similar to wrestling rule sets are, are a, a lot different, but um, it's basically ground fighting. And it's really good for smaller people because strength, although it can be important, um, is minimized because the use of angles and leverage to, mm. to get uh, the upper hand on an opponent is really what it's about. Um, and so he had planted the seed. I was, re- I was planning my, you know, comeback from being pregnant, like I'm going to do this and this and this. And, uh, and I happened to try through gnarly, um, number of years later, uh, we did a team building exercise at a jujitsu gym, gym down the, down the street. And I was, I was training for an ultra marathon at the time. And I just remember like, as soon as I'm done with this run, like, I'm going to give this a try. And it was pretty much like, oh, wow taken with it from the first day. Um, Mm -hmm. it's, it can be very frustrating when you start, but, um, it's like chess with your body and it's just so challenging and fulfilling. Um, yeah, it's been about seven years now and I'm still, still as excited about it as I was. Oh, wow. So how old were you when you started? 38. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I often say, oh, I wish I had started, you know, earlier in life, but you know, I think you find things when you're, you know, when you do and, and I'm glad that I did. And now, you know, my husband at first was also like, oh, we have, you know, we bike and we run and we climb and like, do we really have time for another hobby? And mm-hmm. when I say we, he meant me, <laughs> the collective we, <laughs> um, but now he's doing it. Both my kids are doing it. So we've really met a great community, uh, through the sport. I think like most sports, like it has a really solid community and that's part of what makes it, you know, great and fun. Um, so it's, it's a family affair now. Nice. And do you still bike and run and climb and do those things? I do. Yeah, I definitely do. I bike less probably than I, um, I used to, uh, but I kind of run weekly, um, try to climb weekly. Most of our climbing is my husband's main passion. And so, most of the trips our family takes together, we, you know, we go climbing and, um, jujitsu is still my, my number one, but I love all of those. And, um, yeah, it, I, I feel like they complement each other a little bit. I need time outside, um, to balance, you know, everything. That makes sense. And you also have a PhD in nutritional physiology. So where did that kind of interest come from? Like, were you doing sport at the time? Is that what sort of triggered the interest in that kind of study or which what's the chicken and egg there? Yeah. So, um, my PhD is in biology and my thesis was in nutritional physiology. Uh, okay. So I always kind of just lead with that, um, because it really informs what my background is. Um, and my dissertation actually wasn't on sport at all. It wasn't in humans at all. Um, it was looking at adaptations to herbivory or, um, carnivory in different animals. Um, so both behavioral and kind of physiological adaptations. Um, and during that time I is when I found, um, endurance sports triathlon specifically. And, you know, I think everyone listening, you, you know, we all have had our nutrition mishaps and realize like what a critical, critical, critical thing nutrition is, um, if we're going to get into these things. And, um, so my, you know, having that interest being in, you know, really in a research, um, surrounding in graduate school, like I just geeked out on all the nutrition research um, and then did a postdoc in, in water metabolism in humans and kind of transferred in that direction. Um, but yeah, always interested in nutrition and the overlap of sports really came when when that was my own focus um, in terms of training. Right. What, sorry, what is water metabolism? So looking at, so uh, <laughs> looking at how different um, behaviors or, um, uh, diet choices or, um, lifestyles affect how our body processes water. Um, and we use something called stable isotopes to track that in humans, um, and in animals as well. But the, the project I was looking at specifically was modeling that in humans. Mm, Interesting. Okay. So I want to talk about creating. Um, yeah. and so glad that you're up for this because we, I, we get a lot of questions about creatine, like through all of our communities at Feisty, you know, and it's, um, like we talked about, it's sort of like a supplement that's having a moment, you know, and I want to know, like, who really, 
what's so unpack basically like what's so great about it and if there's any red flags we should look for so first of all what is creatine yeah i love the creatine is having a moment because <laughs> creatine has been waiting for its moment for decades <laughs> right and i say that because in those decades, there has been so much research done on creatine. And I think it got pigeonholed early on as this, uh, you know, weightlifter bodybuilding supplement. Um, and sadly, the benefit that all of us um, could potentially see was kind of pushed to the side because people really um, saw it as something you would take to to take on the physique of like a, a bodybuilder when really like that's part of it. Um, but there are so many other benefits in terms of, of recovery and in terms of injury prevention, and even in terms of brain health. And we can get into the specifics of those, but creatine is a beta amino acid. So what that means is it's an amino acid, but we, we don't see it in proteins. Um, so it's synthesized from three amino acids, methionine, glycine, and arginine. And we do synthesize creatine in our body. So we make it from those amino acids, but we can also get it from our diet, from meats. Um, so when you're supplementing with creatine, it's not, you're not supplementing with something that you don't already either make or get from the food you eat. Um, of course, since we get it from meat, um, vegans and vegetarians have much lower levels because they're only relying on that synthesis of the creatine for the levels in their, their muscles and brain. Right. So would vegans and vegetarians generally get a stronger response when they start supplementing? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, the, when you start supplementing the increase in your creatine levels, um, it ranges from about 20 to 40%. And so vegans and vegetarians would be higher in that range. So they may, may increase their baseline creatine or phosphocreatine levels to 40%, whereas someone that eats meat regularly would, would be on that 20% range. Right. Interesting. So I was just, I was looking at my creatine supplement that I take this morning, right. And even on it, like you talked about how it's known for helping to build muscle mass. It literally t says that it's a supplement for building muscle mass with if and needs to be taken with resistance training. Right? Um, so tell us about like how, do, how, what are all the ways that creatine can help us? Sure. Let's start. Um, I want to start with the mechanism first. So people kind of understand what it does um, because it does build muscle mass and it should be taken with resistance <laughs> training. So you're, you're uh, what's on the label of your creatine is correct. Um, yeah. But when, when we say build muscle mass, it's, you know, you and I, I'm on creatine as well and have been for the last couple of years. Neither of us are like, you know, totally jet. We might be a little right. Jet, right? but we're not like, <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> no, it's not like <laughs> what you imagine, right? So yeah, exactly. It, it, it really takes that resistance exercise, um, the kind of strength training you're doing and, and overall, like what your nutrition looks like in terms of supporting those goals, that's going to determine what the, the ultimate, you know, end point is. So yes, a man that is taking in tons of calories and lifting in, um, like a, a regimen that would, pro, uh, that would promote putting on muscle. Um, those two things may go along with creatine supplementation and may give you the, uh, you know, visual you have in your mind of that, like super jacked, like oily bodybuilder. Right. But oily, they have to be oily. <laughs> I know. Right. I always, they're always glistening. Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you can also be a 40 year old athlete and take creatine with a completely different, um, mm. you know, lifting strategy, completely different caloric intake and still see increased muscle. It's just, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're going to put on tons of muscle mass. It's actually pretty hard to put on muscle mass, especially as we get older. So yeah. back to the mechanism. Um, creatine, like I said, we synthesize it, we get it from food, um, but our full, our, our stores in our muscles, so most creatine is stored in your muscles, um, are not fully saturated. So they're not up to 100%. So when we, we're supplementing with creatine, what we're really trying to do is get those stores up to 100%, or I may, like, as we're talking, use the word saturated a lot, get our muscular stores of creatine saturated. 
And would they never be saturated through diet alone? They wouldn't. We, we naturally break down creatine as part of metabolism. Um, and so we're constantly needing to take in more creatine from our diet or synthesize more creatine, even to keep our baseline levels consistent. Um, and so if you consume meat in your diet, like we talked about, those baseline levels are going to be higher than if you don't. Um, if you consumed meat and then you turned into a vegan or vegetarian, you would see those baseline levels drop because your natural inputs of creatine go down. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So we're not going to eat just meat, meat, meat and, and, and top up our levels. The supplementation actually is the only thing that does that. Yeah. You know, I've been curious, like, uh, you know, if you took someone that was on, I'm not a big fan of the carnivore diet, but if you took someone that was on some right. like the carnivore diet that consumed like the liver King kind yeah, of situation, exactly. right? yeah. <laughs> speaking of oily, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what is their baseline level of creatine look like? Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anybody's ever looked into that. Like naturally how high could we get our creatine levels? But in most people studied, um, you know, that creatine storage is about 60%, um, 60 to 80%, depending on how much meat is in your diet. So, um, yes, we would take creatine supplementation to try to bump that up to 100%. And when we take creatine or we make creatine, it's stored in our muscles as phosphocreatine, which is essentially just a, a creatine with a little phosphate molecule added onto it. Um, and I almost think of creatine as like a storage for that phosphate because it's that donation of that phosphate that becomes really important. So um, when we do uh, muscular work, um, when we're exercising, we're asking our muscles to work, uh, we need ATP or adenosine triphosphate um, for that action, right? And we have a little bit, a teeny bit of stored ATP in our muscles, um, but really we want to be able to generate that ATP quickly. And that's where phosphocreatine comes in handy. Um, you know, we can, we can make creatine through aerobic metabolism, we can make it through anaerobic me metabolism or glycolysis. Um, and then we can also make it through um, the creatine phosphagen system. And it's the fastest way we can make ATP, but it's very limited in the amount of ATP we can make. And what happens is that phosphocreatine donates a phosphate to adenosine dye or two phosphates to make adenosine triphosphate or, you know, with three. So it's pretty much just like, here, take my phosphate molecule and now you're ATP. And that production of ATP um, in someone that's at normal creatine levels, I've seen um, quantified as being about five to eight seconds of like ATP production. When we're up to 100% or full storage of phosphocreatine, we increase that that time or that window of ATP production to eight to 12 seconds, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem like a ton of time, but this is why it can be so helpful in power-based or strength-based movements, hence the connection to bodybuilding, right? Um, right. And, and in many measures in, in uh, scientific studies of these power-based movements, whether it be sprinting or um, max, uh, max weight lifted, like on a deadlift or a specific Olympic lift, or maximum reps for a specific weight, um, you see about a 15 to 20% increase in those measurements of wow. power based huge. activities. So that's huge. So it doesn't seem like a huge increase in window, but it translates to a pretty big increase in, in power generation. And then it doesn't stop there, right? Because if you're able to lift more, your body adapts to that and you put on muscle. Right. Okay. So as I'm thinking through that is so that eight to 12 second window, does it make that more repeatable too, if you see what I mean? So like you do something that's eight to 12 seconds better then can you do something for eight to 12 seconds better the next minute? Yeah. Right. Because it, it, it's kind of this, um, adaptation, like uh, domino effect. Okay. Mm -hmm. If that makes, that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Right. So right. that eight to 12 seconds might help me lift more in the here and now, um, giving my body that adaptation stimulus will put on more muscle, which then along with the eight to 12 seconds will help me lift more again, which will help me put on more muscle. So 
it, you know, I don't know what the timeline is, you know, of something like right, that. Right, for sure. I but yes, I think off. it's yeah. a it's a positive feedback cycle. Right. And then if I think about, you know, think about endurance sports and um, again, excuse my lay person's language, but like, <laughs> but like if you, when you get stronger at the top end, right. Like if you can push more power on the bike or sprint faster, right. It tends to like pull up everything below it as well in terms of like how, like how long you, the Watts you could hold for an hour will go up relative to the Watts you can hold for eight to 12 seconds. Is that accurate and does creatine help with that? Yeah. I don't think there have been very many measurements of specifics like that. And it's funny because, um, when I talk to people, they're like, well, why would it help endurance sports? I'm like, well, why do you have a power meter on your bike? <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I'd say most of the benefits and we can get into this in a minute for endurance, uh, athletes are not necessarily, connected to performance, but I don't think enough studies have been done on performance to really mm. get into, um, you know, whether it could help. And with, it was something like a power meter. I think it, it would make a lot of sense, um, to measure specifically, um, if creatine could help with power during a longer effort. Um, but there are so many benefits besides uh, the in workout or in training or in race um, uh, positives that an endurance athlete may experience um, that, you know, we'll del delve into those, but there are recovery benefits, injury prevent mm. pre preventative benefits. There are benefits for your brain benefits as we age. So um, while I do think there might be a small piece to it in terms of performance. There's definitely more um, to creatine supplementation when it comes to endurance sports. Building muscle can be tough and gains can be so slow, even for those of us who do a lot of strength training. As an ex-endurance athlete who is now in perimenopause, I know this all too well. It can be frustrating to put in the time in the gym and not see the results I'm looking for. That's why it's super important to take the right supplements at the right time. One of those supplements is essential amino acids, which are needed to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein synthesis happens when you eat high quality protein like eggs or whey. And by supplementing with additional essential amino acids, you can make sure you are getting the full benefit of your training sessions. Targeted essential amino acid formulas can be up to four times more effective than just eating protein. I've been taking amino acids for almost a year, and in combination with eating quality protein and a couple other supplements, I have managed to turn the tides on age-related muscle loss, which starts at 30 for women, by the way, and I have continued to make strength gains as I head towards 50. AminoCo has been a longtime sponsor of Feisty Media and has supported all of our brands and podcasts over the years. I recommend starting with AminoCo Perform, and you can grab some at aminoco.com forward slash performance. If you enter the code performance, you will save 30% and receive a free gift if it is your first purchase. Give it a try and let me know how it goes. That's aminoco.com forward slash performance and use the code performance to save 30%. For decades, running shoes have been researched, tested, and designed for men. Brands have relied on the shrink it and pink it approach to sell male shoes to female customers. That's why we are so excited to be working with Hedas. Hedas designs athletic footwear for women that elevates performance, safety, and style. Hedas unlocks the science behind women's biomechanics through dedicated research, creates better shoes for women that support their longevity and performance, and establishes new design standards to promote transparency in a male biased industry. Hedas have a lower ankle collar to reduce rubbing, a breathable mesh toe box to allow for ventilation and to allow for female toe shape, a special kind of plate in the midsole to keep tired legs going, a narrow heel cup to reduce heel slippage and take the pressure off our Achilles, and a rounded instep to create a snug fit. 
Pettis has three shoe models designed for different sessions, the Alma Cruise for long runs, the Alma Tempo for training days, and the Alma Speed for pushing the pace. I've personally been running in the Alma Cruise and I love them. It's the shoe I always wanted and never knew I needed. The fit is perfect in every way. You can get your own pair of Hedas at Hedas.com and use the code FEISTY20 for 20% off. That's FEISTY20 at Hedas.com and it will all be in the show notes. Endurance sports should be accessible to everyone, right? That's why we are so excited to be partnering with Motive. Motive is one of the fastest growing training apps in the world today with thousands of amateur athletes signing up every month and a nearly perfect 4.9 star rating in the app store. You are not a template and your training plan should not be either. Prepare for running races, triathlons, cycling events, duathlons, or swim runs, however your season schedule shapes up, and get training written by some of the best coaches in the world in each discipline who know what it takes to help amateur athletes reach their goal on race day. The app takes the training written by those experts and then creates the most optimal training plan for your schedule, abilities, and goals. Plus, the training is fully customized to your race schedule. How much you can train each week, your current abilities, and the goals you want to achieve in your race. You can use the app for free as long as you want, or get all the upgraded features from the app for just $19.99 a month. But, as a feisty listener, you can sign up at mymotive.com and use the code FEISTY for two months of full premium access. That's right, you get two months of premium for free. So you quite literally have nothing to lose. So head over to mymotive.com, M-Y-M-O-T-T-I-V.com and use the code FEISTY, F-E-I-S-T-Y. And on a personal note, I know the founder of Motive and he is driven to make triathlon and all endurance sports more accessible for the athletes who care about their performance, but who aren't quite ready for a full-time personal coach. If that sounds like you, definitely try the app for two months for free. You literally have nothing to lose. Let's talk about those additional um, benefits while we're here. You know, like, like we, I've heard that creatine is good for like helping cognitive function. Like you said, like, I think you said something about concussion there um, or like, what are the additional benefits that are not performance related? Yeah. So, so to start um, since you mentioned it to start with uh, benefits that might be associated with brain health, there's definitely research showing that um, creatine can be helpful in cases of traumatic brain injury. Um, so in a lot of um, cases like concussions or uh, or issues where um, we're dealing with some kind of trauma to the brain, there are alterations in how ATP is used and, and transported in the brain. Um, and so, and there's studies showing that creatine is actually reduced in cases of these injuries. And so creatine supplementation has been shown to improve, uh, cognition and communication, um, in issues of traumatic brain injury. So being on it, you know, obviously if you're in, (laughs) if you're an endurance athlete, hopefully, you know, you're, you're, a traumatic brain injury is very rare. You know, that would occur maybe more in something if we were crashing or falling or something like that. If you're in a combat sport, it might be more expected. Um, And so, you know, being on creatine ahead of time and not necessarily being reactionary would, would be a good idea, but specific to that, like it, it can definitely be, be helpful. Um, There's also studies showing that uh, it can help with cognitive performance and brain function. So um, studies showing that it can reduce mental fatigue, um, studies showing that uh, in older adults, it can help with cognitive decline, that it can help with better short term memory, um, that it can help in cases of of, uh, stressors like sleep uh, deprivation. Um, and then I think some of the research that I find extremely interesting too, 
is is looking at creatine supplementation and how it can help with different psychiatric disorders. Um, so most of the research that's really promising there are in cases of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. So in a lot of psychiatric wow. disorders, we also see um, uh, changes or, or differences in how ATP is transferred and used in the brain. And so this is where that connection with creatine comes um, wow. so that, that, I can see why it's having a moment. Yeah. Sorry, right. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you there. <laughs> I, and I think it's as we get, um, as we get more information on characterizing something like a, a psychiatric disorder and realize that there's a connection to, to how ATP and energy are, um, are handled in the brain and also see that there's a connection to creatine levels. And, and we know that creatine can help with that. That's where the idea of creatine supplementation comes in specific to those uses. Um, so it's been cool to see that research uh, grow and grow. But back to like some of the other additional benefits that endurance athletes might experience. Um, so in terms of recovery, there's research showing, um, quite a lot of research showing that consuming creatine with, um, carbohydrates or carbohydrates and protein post-training, um, enhances glycogen storage and muscle. So, um, this is especially important, you know, if you're in a glycogen depleting, um, post glycogen depleting run or bike, um, where, you know, like maybe our long run on a Saturday or Sunday where you've really pushed it, um, creatine can help, um, replete that glycogen, which is only going to help you with recovery and with your performance on subsequent efforts. Um, they've shown that in uh, marathon runners doing a 30K race, that those that supplement with creatine had lower levels of inflammatory markers and um, it felt less sore post race. Um, so, those both uh, could definitely help on in terms of turnaround and how you feel um, for your next training block. Um, mm -hmm. this is more in team sports, but in football players, college football players, I think it's college soccer. And then also on a professional basketball team, they, um, did kind of larger studies where they looked at injury occurrence in those supplementing with creatine versus those non supplement, not supplementing with creatine. And they showed lower incidence of cramping of heat illness and dehydration of muscle tightness, um, muscle pulls and um, total injuries and, and mispractices. Mm -hmm. If you're exercising in heat um, or you have a, a race that you're doing in, in higher heat, um, there's research showing that creatine supplementation can help with heat tolerance. And this is uh, thought to be related to the fact that when you um, take creatine, similar to when you take in carbohydrates, both are stored with water. And so mm -hmm. it increases your intracellular water. And um, there have been uh, studies showing that it helps with uh, cardiovascular responses to that increased heat. So things like heart rate and internal temperature and sweat rate. So that could also help with performance, but really specific to, to um, being exposed to high levels of heat. Um, and then if you're injured, um, there's there are a lot of studies um, showing that creatine supplementation during injury helps really maximize your response to rehab because your um, it's helping uh, muscles that would normally um, uh, reduce in size and use just because you're not using and whatever injured limb um, you know we're talking about uh, creatine supplementation can help minimize that loss of muscle and help maximize, um, the return of that muscle during a rehab program. I think that's all the major, major. Is there anything it doesn't do? Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it there. And now they're starting to look at, um, female specific benefits. So there's a great article that came out, I want to say in the last two years, looking at, um, uh, creatine supplementation specific in, in, um, in women. And mm -hmm. obviously, um, you know, there can be a benefit for aging, um, female athletes or aging females in general that do some training, um, where keeping on muscle mass can be a bit of an uphill battle and, um, and adding creatine, uh, into a nutrition program for aging female athletes helps us keep on muscle, which then has a positive impact on um, our bone health. 
So it minimizes the risks of risk of, of things like osteoporosis. Um, so it can be super helpful there. And they've even done studies looking at um, connections of creatine to um, low birth weight and preterm birth. And um, I haven't seen too many studies come out here because obviously it's a very sensitive group, um, but uh, both low birth weight and preterm birth are linked to reductions in creatine synthesis and storage during pregnancy. So there might be something there as well. So yes, wow. there's not, it is having a moment, quite a rather large moment. <laughs> and, and for good reason, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the reason, like my, I started taking creatine, like I said, about a year ago. And my reason was like some of the things you mentioned. So like I started, I'm 47 now. I started having um, some symptoms of perimenopause. And what happened was, was like, I would sometimes for like stretches of two weeks could not, didn't know how my body was going to show up. Like just would feel almost like I was P, like that PMS feeling of like, you can't go hard in the gym, but like for long periods of time. And then what would happen is like, I couldn't go hard. My mood was spiraling downwards. Right. And I was talking to Celine Diego who does our hit play, not pause um, podcast. It's, it's all about like active women, perimenopause and menopause. And she was like, you should try creatine and it might help with some of the cognitive things too, because I was having those like brain farts, like <laughs> that, that people often get with perimenopause. Like, but I still get it, <laughs> but just not as much, you know? Um, and it really did. It really did help with all that. Can you explain um, how, like my brain is like, how does something that helps with like muscle contractions help our brains? Like, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to, um, so one of the things creatine also does it is, is it, it helps with that production of ATP, but it also helps with the shuttling of the ATP. So I don't know specifically, um, relative to, to brain fog associated with perimenopause or menopause, if that's the, like, do we get the fogginess because there's an issue with energy shuttling in our brain, but it's definitely true, um, with, uh, traumatic brain injuries. And, um, it's thought to be also the reason why it helps with things like PTSD and with depression is that the shuttling, both the production of that ATP and then shuttling of that energy to other parts of the brain is the reason why creatine supplementation can be helpful in those cases. So I would, and it is an assumption, I would assume that the mechanism is somewhat similar um, in that it's it's helping both with the production of ATP and also with the shuttling of that energy um, mm. to those foggier parts, I guess. <laughs> right, know. right, totally. Would you recommend that people take ATP for reasons, even if they're not lifting or not doing any kind of you mean creatine? physical training? Yes. Sorry. Did I say ATP? <laughs> no, no, you're good. Speaking, um, speaking of brain farts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends on the reason that, or the benefit they're hoping for, mm -hmm. right? If it is a brain specific benefit, then hundred percent. Yes. Most of the research on creatine in terms of power production, um, is specific to like your supplement said, doing it um, in coordination with some kind of resistance exercise. Um, but if we're, we're hoping to improve glycogen storage or um, potentially benefit because we're doing a race in Death Valley and we want that heat tolerance, um, all of those, um, you know, you, you would benefit from without that resistance exercise piece but mm. all endurance athletes should be doing resistance exercise. Um, True. So, <laughs> I mean, that that is such an important thing for injury prevention um, and and even just proper form in the sport of choice that I, I hope most of the, the folks that are listening have that as part of their training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are there um, natural, like what, what food sources do we get it from? Or are there certain... Are there certain animals we should eat that, <laughs> that have more creatine? Or That's that a great work? question. Um, I do not know if there's certain animals that we eat. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, we store it in our muscles, animals store it in their muscles. So um, any, you know, any meat is going to have creatine uh, stored in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there, are there plant sources? No. 
But creatine in and of itself, um, so most of the creatines that you buy are, uh, when I say creatines that you buy, I mean creatine products that you buy are um, vegan just because it's, it, it's we're using synthesis um, to create or chemical synthesis to create that creatine monohydrate. So it's not like mm-hmm. we're getting animals and isolating the muscle and deriving the creatine from that muscle. So I think right. that's an important point for vegans or vegetarians that might be considering it. Um, all of the creatine sources that I know are vegan. Um, so that's not something to worry about. Right. And are there any groups that you like demographics that you think everybody should be on creatine, like aging people or women or everybody? You know, I've read studies <laughs> where doctors have thought that everyone needs to be on creatine literally. Right. <laughs> um, but I think in particular, um, aging athletes and then three exclamation points, aging women being a subset of that, just because of the risk of osteoporosis. Um, but you know, our health span is really determined by how much we're able to move as we age, right? Um, when we start running into problems is when we stop moving. That's when our bones get weaker. That's when uh, muscles don't contribute to stability. And you see things like falls and, you know, falls and weak bones equal broken bones, which can, can be a downward spiral. So anything that we can take to really help us maintain that muscle mass. And that includes increased protein and creatine. Um, I think it's a really important thing to consider as we age, along with just keep moving. Right. Do you think that all um, women should lift as we age? I do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's definitely part of, um, you know, when I was, was training a lot for endurance sports, I think I I lifted less and, and I think lifting is having a moment as well. <laughs> mm, it is. It definitely is. And I'm happy to see that. Um, and I often wonder like if I had integrated a regular lifting program earlier, like, you know, how outcomes may have changed, you know, benefits that I may have seen, but, um, yeah, I've been lifting pretty consistently, I'd say for the last 10 years. And, um, it's amazing just in terms of injury prevention and just how I feel overall. I, I, th- I think it's been a great thing. Yeah. That's good to hear. I was on an international women's day. I was on a panel um, that was like, and I had been asked to be on the panel for reasons of like, because I'd built a business, right? like nothing to do with. And I told a few stories about sport or whatever, but then the last question was, uh, something like, what do you suggest for like, what are your final look for all women or something? And like, I just went totally off script. It was like, I think you should lift. <laughs> like in the room was just like, what? <laughs> I'm like, not expecting. So I'm kind of glad to hear that that's you confirming that it was good advice. Yeah. It's such good advice. Um, I mean, I think often similar to creatine, like we get, women and especially older women can be intimidating to go into a gym, um, Mm -hmm. or what moves do I do? Or do I need a leg day or do I need an upper body day? Right. It can be a hard thing to navigate. Um, and so finding a community that, um, you fit with that has the same goals, I think can be a good way. And there are a lot of gyms out there. Um, I think that, that cater to, um, aging athletes. Um, my gym specifically is this wonderful mix of, all ages. And we have this 75 year old woman named Pat who like regularly does kettlebell swings with like a 32 kilo, you know, kettlebell. And wow. literally I'm just like, Pat, Pat is my <laughs> inspiration. Like I want to be like Pat when I, you know, as I age, she's such a badass. Absolutely. I have a couple, there's a couple of women at my gym like that too, that I think that it just makes me think like, if you keep doing something, you won't lose it. Right. Like just like keep the kettlebell heavy, (laughs) just keep doing it. And then when you're, when I'm older, hopefully I'll still be able to do it. A hundred percent. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I would put creatine in that category too, just like keep doing it. Like those things work together. Um, and it's only going to benefit as, as we age. So what about dosage, um, or powder versus pills? Like, what do you recommend? Yeah. So, um, many people that have heard of creatine have probably heard it related to loading, loading phases. Yeah. Um, 
And so where that comes from is more about how quickly you want to see a benefit to your creatine supplementation. So it takes time. Like it, when you take creatine, and this is, I think a lot of people get confused about this because I get a lot of questions about, well, when should I take it before or after? So creatine supplementation doesn't necessarily have an acute impact on the exercise we're about to do, right? It's more of building up those storage, um, the creatine storage in our muscles or maintaining the storage if we've already gotten to that 100%. Um, And so when you load creatine, you're just trying to get your stores to 100% more quickly than if you started on what's called a maintenance dose. A maintenance dose is typically five grams of creatine per day. It it's, can be body weight associated, but for most people, it ends to ends up being between three to five grams of creatine per day. And at that dosage, typically it takes about three to four weeks to get to that 100% or that saturation of phosphocreatine storages, storage. Um, a loading phase is also a weight specific dosage. It's I think 0.3 grams of creatine per kilo of body weight. Um, and you're, you are taking about 20 grams of protein per day. Um, so that's, you know, typically it's recommended that you end up taking, dividing that into five gram doses and you take it four times throughout a day because you can taking high levels of creatine. Some people do get some GI distress not at that five gram dosage usually, but at 20 grams, yes. Um, right. And so dividing it up over the course of your day until smaller dosages, if you're doing that, it it reduces that three to four week period to one week. Um, so loading is not necessary unless you're tr- you, there's a reason you have some kind of timeline um, associated with the benefits you're hoping, hoping for. Um, But once you do load, if you do that 20 grams for a week, seven to 10 days is typically recommended, then you drop back down on the maintenance phase. And what you're really just trying to do is to keep your levels at that level of saturation. Because as I mentioned, we naturally break down creatine. So if you don't keep supplementing at that level, then you would drop back down to baseline eventually. Mm -hmm. So if you, you mentioned that about how it's like the timing doesn't matter that much. And that's something we've heard a lot. Like, it's just about getting your like baseline kind of numbers up. Um, Would it matter if you, like, let's say you were someone who was doing two sessions a day, um, two workouts or something like that. Like, would it be helpful to take right after? Yeah. So back to that benefit of helping with glycogen repletion or, um, Mm. you know, post-exercise. I think if you're doing two a days or if you have a heavy training schedule, um, maybe not specific to the creatine benefit, but helping you with recovery in terms of replacing the glycogen that you just spent, I would take it post-exercise then. Right. Right. And then what about, I've seen like most people take it in a powder, I think. Um, but there's also pills. What do you recommend? Yeah. I mean, as long as it's creatine monohydrate and you're getting that three to five gram dose, if that's what you're looking for in terms of, um, you know, you're doing a maintenance phase starting out instead of loading, then it shouldn't matter. Um, I will say that uh, I think we've seen other types of creatine pop up. I don't know if it's like creatine ester. I can't remember all of them. Um, But you always see one pop up that touts like better absorption. Creatine monohydrate is excellently absorbed. Like it's absorption of creatine is not something that we really need to worry about. And research has shown that creatine monohydrate is absorbed better than other forms of creatine. Um, There may be some that are close to comparable, but all of the research that we've talked about is done with creatine monohydrate. So in terms of safety, which we can talk about in a minute, in terms of um, affordability, in terms of absorption, um, and in terms of, you know, really reaping all of the touted benefits, that's the one form of creatine that I recommend. So I've seen gummies, I've seen capsules, and as long as you're getting that creatine monohydrate, um, and you're getting a dose of three to five grams, I think any of those forms are fine. Right. And you're, you're, am I right? The chief product officer at gnarly nutrition. Is I, that the right? I title? like chief nerd more. <laughs> you're <laughs> the chief nerd. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you'll know like what sort of goes into creating the best supplement. Right. And so like, what should we look out for? Cause it sort of sounds like 
you're saying like any like any form of creatine can work. So are there things that we should watch out for? Are there some supplements better than others for some reason? Yeah. So, I mean, I think once again, the form creatine monohydrate, look for a product that has that, um, look for a product that's third-party tested. So that could be NSF, which is gnarly nutrition, the company I work for, all of our products are NSF certified. And there are different levels of that, right? There's a contents certification where that they're testing for all of the label claims, which basically means when you pick up a supplement and it tells you it has five grams of creatine, you know, NSF actually tests to make sure in a serving you, you are getting five grams of creatine with some, right. some room for variation on either side, but essentially you're getting five grams. It also, um, you know, that product has to go through a, a, a screening by a toxicology panel to make sure it's, you know, safe for consumption. Um, it's tested for contaminants like microbes and heavy metals and um, pesticides. And um, then on top of that, if the product is NSF for sport certified, then it's tested for all banned substances on the World Anti-Doping Agency banned substances list. So clearly that's important for pro athletes and collegiate athletes, but it's also you know important for us amateur athletes that don't want any of that crap in our body, right? We, we want to know that what we're taking um, is what we think we're taking based on the label and, and that n- none of that other stuff is in there. So, um, I think, you know, informed choice is another third party certification, uh, consumer lab has a, a third party certification, uh, USP, which stands for us pharmacopoeia. So there are, are different versions of, um, this third party certification, but they're essentially making sure that the product is safe that it is what it says it is. And then it doesn't have other things that aren't listed on the label in it. Right. Right. And are there, you mentioned GI distress earlier. Are there any side effects we should look out for? Yeah. So that GI distress only comes with higher levels of creatine supplementation. So if you are considering loading, that's why it's recommended that you break that 20 gram dose into four smaller doses, you know, separated by a few hours throughout the day. for a long time, it was thought that creatine could uh, lead to issues with your kidneys, could cause some kidney issues. Um, that has since been um, like researched and found to be not true. So there was one study um, where uh, I think participant a participant had an underlying kidney dysfunction, and um, that's where that association came from. And still to this day, like I've had friends who uh, will go to the doctor and they'll they'll say, oh, my my doctor, you know, said I have elevated levels of creatinine um, in my urine and that they're really concerned about it. And they're having me uh, stop taking creatine um, because of those elevated levels of creatinine. And where that confusion comes from is that when you have elevated levels of creatinine, let's take out creatine supplementation and just say you're not supplementing. And as a human, you have elevated levels of creatinine. That is a sign that something could be wrong with your kidneys. Mm. But when you supplement with creatine, because your body's naturally breaking down more creatine, it increases the creatinine. Um, And so those two things are, are, you know, completely different in that one could be like in the case of no supplementation, one could be a marker of a kidney issue, but in the case of supplementation, no matter what, you're going to have increased creatinine um, just because you're taking in more creatine. Um, So they've extensively looked into whether or not creatine supplementation can cause damage to the kidneys. And this is in people supplementing with 20 grams a day for years. So not just for like a 12 week training phase, but we're talking about for two to three years and seen no safety concerns whatsoever. Um, so it has probably the best safety profile of any supplement that I've ever seen. And, um, is they, you know, considering making recommendations for infants and for younger kids that may have issues with it. So for them to make for, for, and them, I say, but, um, you know, the researchers doing creatine, those looking at where creatine can be beneficial, um, for them to even make those considerations, that safety profile has to be really well established first. Um, 
The only other side effect, uh, that's an interesting one, and I think um, we're still trying to tease out, is as I mentioned, similar to carbohydrates, when our body stores carbohydrates as glycogen, they're stored with water. Same thing with creatine, um, it is stored with water. So you can see a, a small increase in water weight in some people, some people don't see it, um, but the research is suggesting that over time, that becomes less of an issue. And I don't know, Sarah, if personally you experienced that and what your experience has been water weight. -wise. I don't really weigh myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I did, I have put on a little bit of muscle because I'm, because I'm now lifting more than I used to as an endurance athlete. Like I have an ass now kind of thing, <laughs> but like, otherwise I don't really notice any difference. Um, I, it's interesting because always when we talk about this water weight thing, I'm always like, is it, except for if you like have to weigh in for a, a competition, isn't that good? Like, aren't you just more hydrated? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, it's like, it's not quote unquote, like fat, which in and of itself, we can debate whether that's good or bad, but like, it's not putting any weight on you. That's bad. So yeah. I think it's this obsession one with weighing ourselves, you know, like getting on the scale all the time and seeing those numbers go up as opposed to like, if you are trying to change your body composition, right. That scale might go up because you put on muscle and that's a good thing. Um, and so disassociating like an increase on that scale, if you do weigh yourself regularly with that being, you know, bad or negative, you know, is a hard thing, I think for a lot of people, um, women specifically to get over. But um, I do hear that concern a lot. And so I always like to talk about it. Um, but, it, you know, there's this great uh, paper that came out also in the last two years, I want to say that is all about um, looking at the myths associated cre with creatine supplementation. And they got a huge group of scientists that all study creatine and they assigned a myth you know, um, that really made sense for that scientist's uh, scope of work um, mm -hmm. and have them address it. And oh, interesting. specific mm -hmm. to the, I can share it with you if you want, specific to the, to the water weight, um, you know, what they really emphasized was that in long-term studies, you don't see a difference in uh, total body water between those supplementing with creatine and those not supplementing. So if that is really a concern for you, yeah. Long-term supp supplementation, it may be less of a concern. I have athletes that I've worked with like specific to climbing, which is a, a you know, could be similar to, to something like endurance sports where power to weight ratio mm -hmm. can be important. Um, and it's all over the map. I have some athletes that feel like it's such a benefit um, to stay on the creatine because of that increased power generation through all phases of their training that they could care less about the water weight. And then I have other athletes which, who will just use creatine during a strength phase, right? So they're increasing their power generation, they're increasing their muscle mass, and then they'll come off of it right before they're trying to send a project or, or um, they have a competition coming up. And it's almost like if they still see that water weight, it's like taking off a weight vest, right? Because you still have that increased muscle, but now it takes about three to four weeks then to return to baseline. And with that return, you're going to be losing potential water that you've been storing. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it impacts both sides of that um, ratio positively. The one thing you do lose is you lose that increased power generation. And so it's really like determining you know, which of those is more of a benefit is more important. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I always feel like I'll take, like, I'll take the water weight. Like I'm a busy person. Sometimes I like to work out for two hours. Sometimes it's hot. I'm sweating, like whatever. <laughs> it's just like any extra benefit. Like I don't need to weigh myself for anything. I, I'm on the same page with you. And I love that. That's, that's how you operate. Right. I hope. Yeah. I just, this obsession with weight, you know, it comes up a lot with like feisty and in our different communities and stuff. Um, and we're hoping to kind of like break that down. You know, I like, I understand it's a performance indicator in some sports, um, but yeah, you know, we don't it's, need it. Yeah. It, it's um, I think also when we're looking for performance, right. It's, it's hard to be so concerned with weight and also maximize how we're doing in our sport of choice. Um, because you're either in a caloric deficit, if you're really trying to, to lose weight, 
And if you're in a caloric deficit, you're never going to perform to your true potential. Um, and so I think that's one thing people lose sight of as well. So like focus on getting strong. I was given that, you know, with jujitsu, um, and as with wrestling, like cutting weight is always like a big part of competing. And just because I fell into the, the sport and was like listening to people around me, um, you know, I cut weight for my first few competitions and would do really well in like a first match, but then in subsequent matches would just end up losing. And one of my coaches was like, just focus on getting strong. And I did that, moved up a weight class and, and, uh, you know, had a lot more success, um, won a master's world championship the first time I, I moved up to that weight class. So I think there's something there. Like we, we should just focus on getting strong. Yeah. Oh, you're, so you're a world champion. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I got <laughs> an old lady world champion. Right. Right. So it's still. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, cool. Okay. Is there anything else that we've left out that we should, that folks should know about creating? Um, I think we've covered most of it. Um, yeah, I think finding a supplement that, um, works for you. And like I said, I think that third party certification is extremely important. Um, just adding it into your daily regimen. It's, it doesn't taste like anything. So, um, adding it to a protein shake or adding it to some juice, taking with some carbohydrate can improve creatine absorption slightly, but as I mentioned, it's already really absorbed and being consistent with it. So just once again, um, taking it every day and not stressing out too much about when you take it during the, the course of, of the day, um, except if you're doing, you know, really hard training, it can be helpful to take after, but just consistency, um, and realizing that the benefits can be, you know, more than just putting on muscle mass. Um, it can, it can help us in a number of different ways. Yeah. And it's definitely helped me in a number of ways. It sounds like for you as well. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Great. Well, Shannon, thank you so much. This has been really fun and informative and I appreciate all of the insights. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on, Sarah. I really appreciate it. As we head into summer, rest and recovery are critical for improving sports performance, reducing stress, and living a long and healthy life. We should all invest in better sleep. So think about the thing you lay your head on for eight hours a night. If it's not exactly right for you, it can lead to needless tossing and turning, or worse, have you waking up with an unrelenting kink in your neck. My new Lagoon pillow has helped me improve my sleep immensely by pairing me with the performance pillow that has everything I need. So I personally was matched with the Otter pillow, shout out to Team Otter, which I love because it has a gentle cooling effect. And I was able to choose how much stuffing I wanted in it, which is super important to me because I'm doing a decent amount of CrossFit these days and my shoulders are kind of creaky. So having a pillow that is stuffed just to the right height keeps my neck and head in exactly the right position and comfortable for the entire night. And as of fall 2023, Lagoon launched their 100% Mulberry Silk pillowcases. It's cool to the touch, buttery soft, and great for your skin and hair. You've got to go check out this pillowcase if you want to feel great and look great every morning. Waking up for morning workouts has never felt better. I'm refreshed and pain-free thanks to my Lagoon pillow. To check it out for yourself, go to lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance and take the two-minute sleep quiz to find your perfect pillow match and then use the code PERFORMANCE for 15% off your first purchase. That's code PERFORMANCE at lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance, whole 15% off, and the link is in the show notes. You can just click through there.
As a lifelong runner and triathlete turned CrossFitter, I am stoked to announce that the athletic eyewear brand Tafosi Optics has joined us as a partner here at Feisty Media. Tafosi sports glasses hit all the marks for athletes. They are shatterproof poly bicarbonate, so the lenses not only reduce glare, but also offer scratch resistance, which I 100% need. They stay in place when you are moving. The hydrophilic rubber nose pads actually get more grippy the more you sweat, so they are secure and don't slide down your face even when you're running in hot conditions. No matter what sport you do, Tafosi has shades for you. Whether you love tennis, fishing, pickleball, running, cycling, or just hanging out on the beach. They are super reasonably priced, which I love, so I can have multiple pairs that go with any outfit. And of course, feisty listeners get a special discount. So head on over to tofosioptics.com and use the code FM20. FM as in feisty media to get 20% off your order. That's FM20 at tofosioptics.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you.